Hi, I'm Christopher J. DeWyer, Senior Vice President of Research at Arden Partners and the Managing Director of the new Future of Work Exchange. Christopher, thanks so much for making time to join us on the Abbey Podcast. Before we dive in and talk about Arden Partners and the projects that you've been building, give us a thumbnail version uh, of your career to date. Wow, uh, great question, John. Uh, 15 years covering HR, contingent workforce, talent acquisition, hiring, staffing, procurement, supply management, um, seeing the world evolve the way it has from a technology, uh, from a talent perspective, really, um, you know, living, pretty much living the future of work, right? That's probably the best, uh, the best condensed version, I could say. <laughs> That's super exciting, man. And I appreciate you sharing a little bit more about it. So tell us a little bit more about, I guess, maybe Arden Partners first, and then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the, the future work project that you've been building. Yeah, so uh, uh, Arden Partners uh, is a Boston-based research analyst uh, uh, advisory firm located uh, just, uh, just west of Boston here in Massachusetts. Uh, been around for about 12 years now. I've been part of the firm for eight years. Um, really preeminent leaders in, in supply management research, and I know... Uh, you think about the phrase talent and how does that mingle with supply management. But uh, honestly, when I came on board in early 2013, it was my goal to uh, to expand Arden's research uh, to, to to a new audience, right? The audience that's concerned with with talent, with work, and and how work gets done. Right, absolutely, and the timing can't be any more any more right, especially <laughs> during the current yeah. times, right? Right. Uh, which I have quite a few questions I want to cover with you from that perspective, the research you've been doing. Uh, but before we do that, tell us a little bit more about the future future of work project you've been building, the platform, and uh, what 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 mission? What's what's the mission of that of mm -hmm. that solution? Yeah, it's a great question, John. Uh, so the future of work exchange is it's really a uh, it's been a dream of mine for years. I mean, the way that I look at the industry, we've, you know, there are, there are individuals, there are business professionals that, you know, when they get up in the morning, they, they visit a new site, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're having their cup of coffee in the morning. Um, and whether it's something to do with film, music, TV, whatever they're into, right. There are so many destination sites out there. I think like the Atlantic, think, you know, the ringer, so many wonderful websites that merge together. Individuals are now from a, from a business professional standpoint, um, what do they want to see for, in terms of, of how work gets done, how talent is evolving? There's no centralized source of news, research, and insights that can blend anything from blockchain to talent marketplaces all on the same website. And so we built the Future of Work Exchange in a way where if you are a CFO, you are a chief revenue officer, you're in HR, you're a hiring manager, there's something there for you pretty much every day, right? We're blending multimedia. We've taken the Contingent Workforce Weekly podcast, which uh, now, now in its sixth season, we're simulcasting it on the exchange. Uh, you know, we're talking about things like the remote work model. Uh, you know, just a couple of days ago, I wrote um, an article on the Delta variant and how it's impacting the world of business. I mean, you don't see... Uh, the, the sort of the convergence of those discussions happening on the same website. And so uh, really it's, 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 uh, it's my child, right? I have two human children, but the future of work exchange is uh, my third child, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Future of work has been absolutely, you know, the timing, the pro timing probably couldn't have been any better, uh, especially coming out of pandemic and how the current situation actually impacts the way people collaborate, communicate, onboard, and hire, and staff, and from mm -hmm. that perspective mm -hmm. is, is fascinating. So based on your research and everything that you've observed, especially through the last couple of years, the industry going in all different directions, uh, from your personal perspective, what are you mostly excited about when it comes to the trends or the ideas or anything that you're researching would be kind of the next big thing when it comes to future of work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, the, the next big thing for the future of work is, is, is the alignment between skill sets and, and projects, right? I think that businesses now have the tools that they've never had before to truly understand. I've got all these project requirements on one side, and now I have the ability to bring in any type of talent on the other and, and align those in a way that we never could before, right? I mean, uh, the phrase total talent management, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, a hot topic here uh, on your podcast. Um, think about the way that businesses 
uh, have a viewpoint or have visibility into the entirety of their talent, whether it's FTEs, their contingent workforce, their talent pools, how they're using talent marketplaces, how they're tapping into direct sourcing, you know, all of these things happening together. I mean, I could say something, I could use a very hip answer and say, well, blockchain is the next biggest thing in the future of work or, you know, using AI. But to me, the real excitement is business leaders and hiring managers have never before had the power they have now to make the best possible alignment between a new project and a role and available talent. To me, that's where the real excitement is regarding the future of work movement. I recently got an opportunity to sit down with an executive from, from Amazon. She's in charge of all of the AWS. Um, and we, we've spent a good deal of, of, of the podcast talking about that particular topic. And some of the points that she had brought up, and I, I would love to kind of uh, pull, the, pull the thread a little bit further from that perspective mm-hmm. with you. So when it comes to future of work, the kind of different stages that really comprise that from comfort to connection to contribution. And she quoted a study that was recently done by Deloitte that the sense of belonging uh, is basically at the top of the food chain when it comes Mm -hmm. to the top reasons, well, you know, essentially what will keep the employees at the companies these days. So um, um, it begs you from a standpoint of that war on retention that we've been hearing about Mm -hmm. that, you know, with so many opportunities that candidates and the employees just seen out there. uh, What are your thoughts overall on kind of the companies that are doing a lot better job of succeeding in the space of retaining the top talent versus the ones that are maybe struggling a little bit more in that space maybe share some practical recommendations that you Mm -hmm. provide probably to your client companies. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good question, John. Um, I mean, I've heard the phrase, we've all heard the phrase employee experience, right? So employee experience itself is an evolution of employee engagement, right? I mean, these are phrases that have been around forever in the world of human capital management. Being a a hardcore contingent workforce analyst for as long as I've, I've been, Um, I always wanted to see that type of thinking applied to all talent, not just FTEs. And so we're living in a world now and and our our new uh, future of work exchange research study coming out in a couple of weeks finds that nearly 47% of the average company's total workforce is comprised of non-employee or extended talent, you know, whether they're contractors, freelancers, professional services, um, gig workers, traditional temp workers, Uh, you're talking about nearly half of your workforce now is considered non-employee or contingent in some way. So you can't forget about these uh, once faceless, nameless workers, right? You have to apply the same rigor, the same amount of energy and, and putting in the time and resources to give them a very positive experience throughout your organization. And so uh, a few years ago, I coined a term called the talent experience, which to me is more encompassing. It's more of, hey, how do we ensure that every candidate, every worker within our organization feels like they are part of a great positive culture, they're contributing to a brand that cares about diversity, inclusion in the environment and corporate social responsibility. We want to build a business that essentially all workers want to be a part of, right? They're aligned personally and professionally with what we're doing, right? And I think that is probably the one of the top areas of the future of work that we're looking at here at Ardent and at the Future of Work Exchange, because you think of future of work, right? I mean, honestly, you ask 10 people to you know, define the future of work, and you're going to get 10 different answers, right? And oftentimes, the future of work is so synonymous with technology and innovation. Very important puzzle piece. But to me, the real, the real value of talking about work optimization and the future of work, are, it's within those conversations around experience, right? How do you get the best possible talent? How do you keep that talent? You ensure that they have a positive experience, whether it's the first email or phone call, all the way to uh, re-engagement for, for future projects and initiatives. It's all about the talent experience. We've seen different trends also come about such as direct sourcing um, Mm -hmm. and 
the implementation of you know various technology solutions by companies of various size to be able to scale up or down such as the employer of record solutions and other ways to optimize how you onboard how you process how you essentially you know collaborate and, and employ uh, workers of different types contingent workers consultants even the full-time employees mm -hmm. uh, what what are some of the recommendations or maybe some technology solutions that you've you've seen emerge in the last couple of maybe even months or even the, the past year coming out of pandemic that really helped the company succeed in the space of being able to create a, a very flexible work environment and workforce mm -hmm. solutions uh, to be able to accomplish all of the fluctuations in in the markets and you know in the availability of candidates and so forth Right. Yeah. So John, direct sourcing, um, you know, you're, you're speaking right here, man. Yeah. I love, I love the topic of direct sourcing. Um, I mean, I remember four or five years ago, a lot of us here in the United States did not know what direct sourcing was and direct sourcing has been so popular over in Europe for, for decades that um, it's funny when I talk to someone who runs a, you know, who's a part of talent acquisition, or they're running a contingent workforce program in the UK, Ireland, you know, Germany, wherever it is over in Europe. And I mentioned how hot direct sourcing is, they laugh because they're like, oh, we've been doing this for years. I mean, essentially, it's applying, you know, uh, the elegance of recruitment to your non employee talent, right. Uh, and so going into 2020, um, uh, the vast majority of organizations were very heavily focused on direct sourcing, they're focused on talent pools as well. And then the pandemic hit. And so you had a lot of organizations really, you know, starting to understand like, okay, I can't scale up right now, but I can do the next best thing. And I can really uh, communicate and collaborate with the candidates in my talent pools. I can let them know what's happening within the business. Um, I can't offer them a position yet, but I can stay in touch with them and ensure that I'm touching them with some type of value. Hey, here's a message from our our, our, our CHRO on um, the outlook for the rest of the year, right? And so when things got a little bit better economically, you know, late last summer, early fall of 2020, you know, direct sourcing was, was right there for businesses, right? You know, businesses that were scaling up really, really quickly, they were able to tap into, you know, curated pools of top tier, very much aligned talent, and they were able to beat the competition. And they weren't able to do that without, the technology out there that allows them to, uh, to you know, to, to use, you know, artificial intelligence led uh, talent creation or um, automated talent referrals, candidate referrals, um, you know, uh, talent uh, uh, service led talent curation is, is really big within the world of managed service providers today. So um, all of these things are coming together to really make direct sourcing the premier way for businesses to uh, to find and engage and integrate talent into the organization. Um, I think something like, you know, uh, in between 20 and 30% of all talent today uh, is being uh, funneled through a talent pool of some sort. And I expect that to, to increase by 25, 30% when, when 2021 is all is, is over. Right. I mean, there are so many businesses that, you know, they understand that, you know, staffing suppliers are always going to be important. You know, one thing that I will never say is staffing, is dead because it's not staffing suppliers play a very pivotal role. You have preferred suppliers, you have specialized suppliers that will give you access to talent that you cannot find anywhere else. But at the end of the day, we are going to save money, we're going to save time, and we're going to get better candidates if we take on that recruitment ourselves. And that's what direct sourcing really does. And um, wonderful technology solutions out there that focus on anything from talent curation and talent segmentation all the way down to communication with candidates and even helping companies build up branded job portals. I mean, it's a wonderfully, wonderfully deep technology market. Yeah, absolutely. One of the, the trends that we've also seen some success, especially when it comes to our portfolio of clients is the model of nearshoring, uh, where you have the capabilities of, you know, at the same time, scale up or down, utilizing mm -hmm. the resources you're sure, uh, mainly because, you know, the time zone difference is uh, very challenging, especially in the technology space where we play. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious to, to get your thoughts on other creative solutions that you had seen companies implement when it comes to 
winning that war on talent acquisition, especially in such a candidate driven market and the scarcity of various skill sets, mm -hmm. companies have to get very agile in a sense yeah. to be able to utilize different methods to accomplish their staffing needs. What have you seen? What have you observed? Or maybe some of the recommendations based on your research? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think a big part of, of where businesses are at today is it's not just compensation. It's not just the role itself or the work that's about to be done. It's about experience. It's about culture. And it's about some of the non-financial benefits, right? Um, I think the statistic, is, and I forget forget how far back the Bureau of Labor Statistics goes, but they found that May of 2021 saw the biggest number of resignations in United States labor history. And I bet their data goes back 50, 60, maybe even 70 years. That's incredible. Now you think of a pandemic, you think of uh, depression, uh, you think of um, horrible economy, and you think of a very high rate of unemployment, right? Well, um, maybe it's the stubbornness of the United States, right? <laughs> just the fact that, um, you know, so many states were just willing to reopen, right, in the thick of things last year. But um, unemployment has gone way down. And now workers are choosing where they want to be. And so businesses must tap into that aspect. You know, it's not just offering the highest pay. It's not offering the, you know, the, the, uh, the best possible position, right? but it's about the benefits. What can we do as a business to ensure that this, this new role or this open role can appeal to not only the, the, the person with the best skill sets, but also appeals to the person that really wants to be part of our organization and they can feel flexible, they can feel that they've got a balance between work and life and they feel really in tune with our culture as a, as a, um, as a brand, right? So, I mean, I, I've talked to so many individuals over the past you know six, seven months about you know, where they want to be in their careers right now. And they've gotten a taste of what it's like to be able to take their kids to swim class at two in the afternoon. Or, um, I mean, one, one, I mean, I've been working from home for years, right? So my world hasn't really changed. But, um, you know, hearing from so many individuals that they've never been more productive, they've, they have the ability to take a couple hours off in the afternoon, get that dentist appointment out of the way, or maybe, you know, hop on, I mean, what I do, even though it, uh, um, I don't get through many uh, uh, rides that are longer than 30 minutes, but hop on the Peloton, right? And get a workout done uh, at one o'clock in the afternoon, right? You couldn't do that if you were in the office. And so it's more about creating or fostering a culture of flexibility um, that appeals to a person, not just their skill sets, that really is going to help businesses stand out and create more of a competitive edge and, and how they get people to to apply for jobs and be part of their talent pools so look at it from a different lens from the candidate perspective from the contingent worker standpoint because mm -hmm. i've been there myself i've been a consultant for many years you know on the technology side for companies of various size and i've interacted in those circles for still do uh on on so many levels one of the major concerns that contingent workers or consultants continuously have is number one, the stability within an organization that they decide to engage with. Mm -hmm. There's always that perception, the full-time employee versus the contractor or consultant. Right. And then also from a perspective of the availability of the benefits, I think it's always challenging for contractors and contingent workers mm -hmm. to be able to command exactly the same benefits package uh, as uh, kind of your traditional full-time employee would in a sense. Right. Uh, what are your recommendations uh, for 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 that side of the equation for the for the candidates for the contingent workers when it comes to some of those areas that are still blurry? Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I mean, John, I'm glad you used the word blurry because that's that's really what it is, right? I mean, we we are we are still living in a world where compliance needs to be top of mind, right? I mean, a business cannot treat a contractor or a temporary employee like an employee, like a full time equivalent, or you know, they're, they're going to be in trouble, right? Um, but there are things, that, you know, from the contingent workers point of view that they can look for that they can understand, like, okay, I'm not going to get health benefits, but, you know, maybe the business is going to be doing something to help me tap into, um, you know, maybe a healthcare platform connector where I can find benefits for my family and I, and even though they're not technically paying for it, they're helping me find what I need, right? And I think that that's where it's, it's, there's a lot of, there's, 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 air, there's a gray line between the business and the contingent worker that 
um, it's there for a reason, right? I mean, companies are using contingent labor. They've always used contingent labor because, you know, you, you don't have the, the long-term relationship, you know, it's, you know, it's like speed dating, right? You don't, you're not, you're not married. You have the ability to cut ties when you want, right? And you're paying for the talent and that is it. You're not paying for anything else, but we're not living in, you know, 2010 anymore, or even 2015. We're living in a world where it's, it's the candidate's world. And I'm not saying that they have the ability to, you know, command a price or command a level of benefits or compensation that uh, that's ridiculous, but they should be able to say, well, you know what? Um, I want this engagement to be five months long. I want the ability to, uh, to, to not, to, to, to not be available, you know, two business days per week and only available Monday, Wednesday, Friday, contingent workers should, should use the, use some of those sort of non-compensation, non-hard benefit side of, 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 of themselves to, to score the best possible role, right? Okay, here are the here are the core guidelines for me working for your organization, right? Um, I don't have to come on site. Um, I'm only going to be spending three hours a week on video, and um, you know, my here are my delivery dates, my milestones. Here's when I'm going to be delivering key pieces of this project. So um, that's where I really see, you know, from the candidate uh, perspective, things changing a little bit. And I understand, you know, when you start to get into the benefit side, you know, I'm talking health benefits. Um, you know, I think that's where, you know, businesses need to be able to figure out a way and it's still not answered yet. It's still a big question mark, but how can you help your contingent workforce get the benefits that they need without, without actually offering them to them? And that, that's a, that could be a really interesting, you know, point of view, especially, you know, we're living in a world where, you know, I mean, COVID is very, very real and it's a lot of deficiencies in our healthcare system. Uh, have been exacerbated by an 18 month and ongoing pandemic. And so healthcare is going to be more important. And I understand businesses cannot offer that to contingent workers, but maybe they can do something to help them find uh, exactly what they need. And I'm glad that you brought that point of view because not to give myself a plug here, but that was one of the core reasons why we really set out to build a solution such as my base pay mm -hmm. is, right. is based on that personal experience is really when I was a contractor, when I was a consultant, really lack of resources, a lack of, um, you know, solutions out there that would provide me with those benefits, with those opportunities, same as, you know, the full-time employee mm -hmm. equivalents. Uh, I think that's, that's very important. And I've seen a lot more companies embracing that particular concept and which is super exciting kind of in favor of the, in favor of the candidate side. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the trend I hope continues to grow. I agree. Chris, from a standpoint of, the 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 interview aspect of when you when you look at it from both angles from the candidate and the hiring manager it's the space that's very challenging and i'm yet to see anybody to be consistently really good at that mainly because a lot of the interviews are based on that past experience which is very flawed thanks that's missing on the team and instead looking at what is the you know weakness we can tolerate? Share your thoughts on the interview aspect from your research or anything that you have personally done. Right, and so what's really really interesting is, um, and again, like I said, we we have a new research study coming out uh, uh, sometime in, in mid to late August. And one of the questions I asked in the in our research survey, which went out to uh, about three hundred and fifty, um, you know, director VP level above uh, HR procurement and talent acquisition practitioners, was you know, what was the biggest impact of the pandemic on your workforce and on your talent and how you got work done? And I was expecting things like, okay, revenue shortfalls, problems with sales, um, you know, lots of layoffs and furloughs, but really the number one answer, and I think it was something like 82 or 84% said that it forced them to reimagine traditional workforce management processes like interviewing, like onboarding, right? And so, I think if there's one silver lining, and I mean, I just I just said this on the Contingent Workforce Weekly podcast, you can't put a gold star in a pandemic and say it was a good thing, right, with death and suffering and tragedy. Um, but if there's any silver lining is that it's really forced a lot of businesses to reimagine some of the, the inadequacies and in what they were doing from a workforce management perspective, right? Um, you know, when you take in-person interviewing away, you take in-person per in onboarding away, you have to do things a lot differently. And so... Um, it's not just, you know, video interviewing, but it's, it's, it's using deeper candidate assessment tools, understanding, okay, 
um, instead of just hiring this person based on a 30 minute video interview, can I give them a sample problem to solve? You know, if I'm a co if I'm looking for a coder, um, can I give them a, uh, an online sort of exam, right. To figure out, you know, do they have the chops to, to come in and handle this project? Right. Um, and so that's a good thing, right. I mean, I think it keeps both businesses and workers on their toes, right. And, you know, if you really are a good fit for the project, uh, we're going to find out, we're going to test you. Right. I mean, um, I mean, I remember honestly, uh, 15 years ago, uh, a close friend of mine, um, he got hired at Google and he was telling me about the interview process and uh, way, way ahead of their time. Um, they, he literally, you know, sat in a, sat in a boardroom conference room, you know, with a whiteboard and they wrote a problem for him on the whiteboard, walked out of the room and said, we'll come back in an hour. And it's like, wow, you literally are thrown right in the fire. Um, you know, I'd love to see more of that in, in the workforce management world where, you know, I mean, personality shines through, uh, the way a person makes eye contact, the way they talk to you, those are all very important things that you can sort of capture or reimagine through video. But, um, you know, the problem solving, um, you know, those critical problem solving abilities, you may not be able to get those in a non, in, you know, in, in a, without being right in front of that person. So I think candidate assessment is going to become a really big deal for organizations because, They've had to reimagine how they do things. And candidate assessment is one that was lacking before the pandemic. And I think it's just going to be enhanced in the months ahead. Last but not least, Chris, what are, what's your content diet looking like these days? What do you consume on a daily basis when it comes to specific sources? Obviously, you mm -hmm. do a lot of research yourself. Right. You write a lot. Yeah. So I can, <laughs> you know, can't help but ask what are the different sources that you consume personally, whether that's for professional research that you do and maybe even on the personal side mm -hmm. to share with us those. Yeah, so th that's a good question. I mean, being a researcher for such a long time and being a thought leader, um, I'm not reading a lot of other blogs, but um, I do find that I'm looking at some of uh, my peers and colleagues who are writing for Forbes, right? There's always great articles in the future of work. Um, a lot of great uh, HR blogs out there. Um, I read a lot of the Harvard, Harvard Business Review, HR research, you know. Um, I have a good friend. His name is John Younger. He wrote uh, the Bible on Mutual agile talent. Friend. Yeah, Mutual, he was it. on the podcast. Yeah, that's, and that's great, great to hear. Friend. I actually, you were talking about Forbes, and he came to mind. I was yeah, like, immediately, right? Yeah. Uh, John is like, oh my God. I mean, it's it's. I've never gotten to meet him in person, but when I do, I'm going to give him the biggest hug. Um, I love that man. He is he's brilliant, and uh, every time I talk to him, literally an hour and a half, two hours pass. And we're like, wow, we just talked for two hours. We didn't realize it. But I mean, he wrote the Bible on agile talent, right? And that's 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 really the foundation of a lot of a lot of thinking today, right? Um, on the personal side, um, I, every day I check out the Atlantic, right? I love I love reading about politics, about culture, about news, and um, even though I, I I wish we weren't living in a pandemic world, I love hearing about the scientific aspects of you know where we are in terms of. Uh, you know, epidemiology and things like that, because I am a nerd. So <laughs> I love that type of stuff and very heavy into science fiction. I'm reading a wonderful book right now called, uh, called The Effort, which uh, is about a fictional comet that's about to hit earth and um, a great, great lesson in diversity because the, the team that they build to put together whatever they do to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to explode the comet um, is a diverse team of people from different backgrounds. And uh, I was thinking about that. I was, I was reading the book on vacation. So, um, so yeah, there you go. That's super cool. And thanks for sharing that. It's very exciting because with so much information overload out there, I'm always fascinated the different strategies that people right. utilize <laughs> to keep their minds, you know, protected in a sense and very right. being very selective mm -hmm. with right. what information you decide to expose your mind to. So that's super cool. Chris, I can't thank you enough for your time today. Very short and insightful conversation. You were very generous with the information that you shared. So I would definitely appreciate all of the things that we've talked about. Well, John, I appreciate uh, you guys having me here. Uh, love, love to talk about all the different topics related to the future of work. So really appreciate the time here.